Kind of like that Catholic man I heard about who had a nagging secret. He, he just couldn't keep to himself anymore. And so he, he decides to go to confessional and admits to the priest that he's been stealing building supplies uh, from the lumber yard at which he worked. And so uh, the priest said, well, 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 son, how much slumber did you steal? He said, well, I, I stole enough to uh, build my house. And uh, then I stole enough to build my son's house. And I got two daughters and I stole enough to build their houses. Oh, there's that cottage down by the lake. The priest said, oh, oh, my, my goodness, son, that's a, that's a, that's a far a serious offense. I'm going to have to think of a, of a, of a long-reaching penance for you to pay. Have you ever thought about doing a retreat, he said. And the man said, oh, no, Father, I've never thought about doing a retreat, but, but if you'll get me the plans, I can get the lump. <laughs> <laughs> that was his idea of repentance, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> And maybe you know somebody like that, or maybe you maybe you're like that. I don't know. But here's the reality, man. That, that is a true picture of an individual who would invite the reform of religion into their life, but never experience the new birth. Friend, let me say to you this morning: you can try to clean your act up all you want to, but until you invite Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life, you are nothing more than a lost, hell-bound sinner. Amen. Amen. Friend, if that's you today, I plead with you. Right now, off the front, I plead with you to give your heart to Jesus Christ today. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Yes. You can be set free from the pain of your past today. Today. And so as we look in this text, I want to talk to you about two things. Two, two, two things, uh, and then there'll be several things under the next thing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm a kind of like I'm a long-winded preacher, so just bear with me, all right? There's both a primary application and a personal application in this text. To remain true to the text, I have to tell you, the primary application of this text is to the nation of Israel. In the Old Testament, they had become a nation filled with idolatry. I mean, uh, you, you find them worshiping in the high places and, and, and bowing down at the veils of false gods in the, in the Old Testament. And, and, and the, the Lord had had enough of their hardness of heart and refusal to repent that He brought certain judgment upon them by way of the surrounding nations. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, they came and carried them off captive, took them into exile. They put them into slavery, hard bond, all kinds of different things. And, and, and that is what sin brought in their life. Can I say to you, this morning, sin will bring hard, a hard road for you. Amen? I mean, yeah. it really will. And, and so Jesus, He's wanting to move into, the, into their hearts and lives. And so He begins to tell them of this scenario. If you don't get right with God, your last state is going to be worse than your first state. That's what He tells them. And prophetically speaking, uh, just after the cross, uh, the Romans in AD 70 would come and, and man, they would destroy Jerusalem. They would destroy the temple. I mean, uh, just blood uh, run to the, uh, to, in the streets like uh, uh, the, one of the bloodiest battles you could ever imagine there in Jerusalem. And, and even further still, looking to the future tribulation time, which is the time of Jacob's trouble, friend, it, it is going to be a, a terrible, terrible state for the nation. That's the primary application. In fact, if you were to go and read the book of Revelation, uh, some of the application or the emphasis here, Revelation 13, one <coughs> talks about a beast having seven heads. I mean, th th this is all uh, speaking of future events in there to, to the nation. But I want you to notice something. Even though the primary application is futuristic and to the nation and was even present in Jesus' day, in our day, there's a personal application. Yeah. There was a personal application then, because Christ speaks of an unnamed man. Notice what he says. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man. Man, I'm talking about a, a, an individual, a person right here. Specific. And so what we realize is the words of our Lord will bring to life the scary reality of demon possession. We're not talking about something that's mythological. We're not talking about some hocus pocus or Harry Potter stuff, man. We're talking about the real, a uh, very real reality that a demon can possess a person. Now, prior to my going into full time ministry, I've never experienced anything like this. In January 2011, I became a student pastor of Hillcrest Baptist Church. And I, I had been somewhat uh, 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 
I don't know what the word, uh, uh, maybe protected, if you will. I, I've been stuck off in the hillsides of Gordonsville, Tennessee. And, and, and so I never, I never really realized that, uh, much like this, I've read the Bible, but I've never experienced it personally. That is, until I went to the psych ward at McFarland Hospital. But there was a young lady there that I went to see. She was not crazy. She had a tremendous drug problem. I mean, she she had been she grown up going to church some. Her mom and daddy had raised her right uh, to a certain extent. They had shown her what the truth was in Christ, and and, and so uh, yet uh, she she just chose the wrong. Do you know what I'm saying? She chose the wrong and walked off in sin, and it brought her a lot of pain. Can I say to you this morning? If you want to choose the dirtiness of drugs and alcohol, you may wind up walking with the demon-possessed people. Do you know what I'm saying? And you better realize it, friend. God in His grace is trying to show you something today. And, and, and so I went to see this young lady. I, sit, I, I go into the common area in the cafeteria. I sit down at a table with her, and I begin to pour the words of life into her. I'm telling her what Jesus said, that you can find forgiveness. You can repent of your sin, be born again, receive Christ by faith, and you can be set free uh, from not only the pain and misery that you feel on the inside, you can be delivered forever, eternally. Uh, the past, the wages of your sin can be settled with Jesus. Right. And, and so I'm pouring this into her. And as she's listening, she's weeping, she's hearing everything that, that the Spirit of God is saying to her in that moment. And, and as I'm pouring into her, my back is to the door. I hear, out of, out of my ear, I hear an individual walk in the room. I, I turn to look back over my shoulder, and I realize it is another woman who has partially walked in the room. She's kind of stuck her head uh, around the corner like this right here. And she starts to hiss at me like a snake. <laughs> By the grace of God, I never, I never slowed down. I, I, I just turned back around. I, put, I continued to pour the scriptures of this young lady. The, the hissing, she stayed left. She walked away. I'm, th I'm still giving the gospel, giving the gospel, giving the gospel. Begging this girl to give her heart to Christ. And in just a moment, that, that woman, she returns. She, she comes back in the door. And as I'm, I'm telling this woman of the deliverance she could find in Christ, that demon possessed girl looks at her says, Honey, you don't have to stay there and listen. And she invites her to leave and go. Oh, I finish praying with that young lady and I get up and I walk out the hall, down the hall. And as I'm walking down the hall toward the exit, there's a good-looking young man. I'm talking about one, one good-looking young kid, man. He, he's walking toward me. He's grinning from ear to ear. I mean, he, he's worse than a possum, man. I mean, he's, he's got a grin on his face, man. I mean, just like the Grand Canyon. And I said, hey, bro, how you doing? He said, man, I'm doing good. It's the best day of my life. I said, it's the best day. Man, you just must have got saved or something. You must have just met Jesus Christ. He looked at me as serious as he could. With dead in eye, he said, I am Jesus Christ. The ensuing conversation with self-proclaimed Jesus was quite common. He began to quote, uh, try to quote scripture with me and then decided he needed to go get his Bible because he couldn't remember the words that he had supposedly wrote, written. I walked out the door, got on the elevator, and it hit me. It hit me. I had just come in contact with at least two individuals who were housing unclean spirits. You say, man, I don't believe that mess. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Friend, let me tell you something. I don't care whether you believe it or not. It's in the Bible, so it must be true. Amen. And Jesus is telling us here uh, of a man who had an unclean spirit. Yeah, prior to these words in Matthew 12, we find the Lord Jesus. He has personally encountered demons at least four times. Uh, in Matthew 10, as He sends out the disciples, He gives them power to cast out demons. After these words in chapter number 12, there are at least two other recorded uh, demon possessions that the Lord will encounter. Uh, not to mention the fact that, that Judas, one of the twelve, the, the Bible says that the, the devil will enter him, Jesus will confront him, and, and, and so even, even it appears that the Pharisees conducted some sort of demon extraction based upon the words of, uh, of Matthew 12, 27, that Jesus talking to them, he says, if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? They, they practice.
demon extracts you to? Let me, let me, let me say this right here. I, I'm just, look here. If you expose your children, parents, to this kind of activity via social media, internet, movies, and you don't confront it with the truth, do you know what's going to happen? They're going to believe the lie and think that stuff's all right, man. That they're going to begin to dabble in witchcraft and witches and sorcery. Friend, listen to me. That is all demonic. Yeah. It is absolutely inspired out of hell. And Jesus is warning us about things like this in His Word. The church ought to, uh, the, ought to be the last place that, that we have any of our children participating in anything like that. And so we, we see that, that he, he's talking about demon possession. They even call Jesus the ruler of demons. Uh, you say, well, Brother saying that, that text says it's an unclean spirit. I, I, I realize that. You know the word spirit in the Greek, it simply means breath of air. It's used in a variety of ways. And one of those ways is to suggest a demon. In fact, if you were to look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 33, uh, the Bible would say this, And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil. Unclean devil. And so let's just get the facts straight this morning. We're talking about a dirty demon. A dirty demon. And so when I, when I see this, when I realize this, based upon my past experience, based upon what the text says, I, I realize that there are some things that we need to realize. Are you willing to say anything? Moral reform without being reborn is sure to break, bring great misery. Do you know what I'm saying? Come on, brother. You can clean your life up, but friend, unless you get a new life by way of Jesus Christ, you're still in as much trouble as you were before. Okay. Uh, let me say this. Uh, uh, an individual who is demon-possessed, uh, or who you might think is crazy. Listen, they don't need sedation by way of medication. They need regeneration by the Holy Ghost of God. Man, we can medicate and only... We, you cannot medicate a sin problem. That's what America's trying to do today. Friend, I don't know you, you don't know me, but I'll tell you this much. If you just get right with God, things will get easier in your life. I didn't say they'd be easy. They'll get easy. When I met Jesus about 13, 14 years ago, He changed my life. I carried the pain of my past around with me every day. I'd go to bed every night. When if I'd wake up in hell, I'd get up every morning fighting the same battle. And not until I said yes to Jesus did I find relief. Yeah. You said, you ever had any problems since then? I've had a bunch of problems. Man, I've had a bunch. And so, man... I just want to say to you, you can turn over a new leaf if you want to, but you need a new life. Amen. You, 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 you can set your goals and you can do all this. and Man, resolutions are not the answer. Jesus is the solution. Yeah, amen. amen. You know, I had an opportunity to deal with some recovering addicts and go to AA meetings and counseling and those things are good in their place. Friend, listen. If you're, you're still struggling with addiction here this morning, I want, I want you to understand. They'll teach you of a higher power. But friend, there's none higher than God. Yeah. Right. Jehovah Jireh, Jesus Christ, the Lord, my Redeemer, my Healer. Yeah. He's Jehovah Rapha. He's the one who can bring forgiveness and comfort. And so as we look back in this text, I want you to notice first this discussion. Notice the discussion. Verse 22, there was a man who was brought to Jesus. Look back to verse 12, chapter 12, verse 22. The Bible says that then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind, and mute. And he healed him. This man housed the demon, and the Lord being uh, Lord of all over demons' disabilities, he, he, he heals that man. And so in that moment, you know what I can see? I can see the words of that song, The Great I Am Come to Life. You, you, ever, sing, you ever sing that song here? It says, The mountains shake before Him, the demons run and flee. At the mention of Your name, King of Majesty, there's no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the Great I Am. And right there, Jesus says, He just rebukes that demon and He extracts him right there in front of that crowd. And so, 
So here he is. That, that miracle takes place and the Pharisees accuse Jesus of being Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. That's just like a bunch of religious folks. Uh, to begin to point, name, point fingers and say, well, well that are you. No, listen. Jesus is Lord. Amen? Amen? And he can do whatever he deems necessary to do. And he did it. And so he extracts this demon. He rebukes the thoughts of those uh, religious indivi individuals. And, and he says these words. He says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Now, 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 now Jesus is going to speak of a, uh, of a house here in this text. But friend, he's not talking about a house like this. He's talking about your house right here. Yeah. He's talking about the body. And so I want to say to you this morning, if you are an individual who seems to spend more time in the world than in the will of God, Christ is telling you your house is going to fall. You're going to fall. A house divided against itself cannot stand. You say when. I don't know when, but it's going to. It will eventually catch up with you. And so you say, man, I'm not out living the immoral life. I, 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 I just do, I do a little bit of this, I do a little bit of that. And surely that's no big deal to Jesus. Uh, friend, listen. It's not, uh, this world can condone your sin if it wants to, but the Lord uh, is the standard by which we ought to live. Yeah. In, him was, he, in Him is life. He is perfectly holy. He is right. He is all that is just contained in a body. He has set the standard by which we ought to live. I'm not the standard. The pastor's not the standard. Jesus Christ is the standard by which we ought to set our life to live by. Yeah. So any sin is more sin than he had for him. He was no sin. Amen? Amen. You say, well, I don't live in my life. Well, neither did this demon was this guy as far as we know. He was blind and mute. Yeah, he couldn't talk. He, couldn't say, he, he never said a cuss word. You know what I'm saying? But yet he still has the demon. And, and so he, he, he sets this guy free. Now let me say this. I don't think a Christian, one who's really been saved, can be demon possessed. And let me tell you why. Because you've been bought with Christ. You've been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Friend, if you want to secure your eternity, be sealed with the Holy Ghost of God, just give your heart to Jesus. You'll never have to worry about your retirement in eternity. Amen? Amen. You've got it settled. Jesus paid it all. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so, this, this individual who has this demon, he was obviously lost. And that, that's very important moving forward. We need to hear what, what the Lord is going to say to us. He was obviously lost. And so, for a Christian, I don't believe you can be demon-possessed, but I do believe that you can be demon-oppressed and influenced. Do you know why a Christian can't uh, is miserable when he lives in sin? Because you've got the Holy Ghost living inside of you. And so if you're out trying to live like the world, friend, you're supposed to be different than the world. In fact, a person from another world lives inside of you. Yeah. That's why you're miserable. So I say to you this morning, just get off the fence, get all in, and get on fire for God. Amen? Yeah. And God will use you to change those around you. And so he moves from talking about this house being divided to the unpardonable sin. You say, what is the unpardonable sin? Have I committed the unpardonable sin? I don't think anybody who's ever questioned whether or not they've committed the unpardonable, unpardonable sin has committed the unpardonable sin. Does that make sense? Because if you committed the unpardonable sin, you wouldn't care. You wouldn't care. And it, it specifically in the text, the unpardonable sin speaks of attributing the things of God to Satan. You say, what's that look like today? I believe it looks like this. I believe that it looks like an individual who's been beckoned by the Spirit of God deep in their heart. You reject Him time and time and time and time and time and time and time again. You say, no, Jesus, I'm not giving you my heart today. I hear the Spirit's call, but I'm not doing it. For sooner or later, you're going to commit the unpardonable sin. And there'll be no more opportunity for you. I, I don't know when, I don't know where, but I believe... There's an unseen, unknown deadline that the individual who rejects Jesus so long, he'll cross it. And at that point, he'll not care anymore. So hear me. He said, Brother Shane, I'm 65 years old. I've sat in this church year after year, and I've heard the gospel. I've sensed the Spirit of God in my heart, and I've never said yes to Jesus. Everybody here thinks I'm saved, and, and God's still dealing with me. What do I do? You give your heart to Jesus today. Today. The very fact that God's still speaking to you you sense God doing you, that's grace. Amen. That's yeah. grace. You can be saved today. 
And so here we realize that, that he's talked about the house divided. He's talked about the unpardonable sin. Then he goes into verses 34, 37 uh, through 37. He, he talks about a tree being known by its fruit. Did you know that by divine design, we, we can't tell. I, I can't look in your heart today and see if you're a Christian. I don't know who's saved and who's not. You don't know if I'm saved, but I'm telling you, I am. Amen. I'm saved. I know I am. I know I'm saved. You know you're saved, but I don't know if you're saved. Are you with me? But by divine design, God says that which is in the heart will work its way out of a man, and we can know them by their fruits. What kind of fruit are you bearing this morning? How's your life? How does it explain what you believe? And so we, he's talking to him, he's explaining. Remember, it started in cast a demon out of old boy. He talks about the unpardonable sin, talks about knowing their fruit. Then he goes into a series of verses right there prior to our text. Talking about the nation and their refusal to repent. Man, listen. He, he, he says, hey, the men of Nineveh will rise up. And Did you know that's the nation that Jonah went to preach to? And, 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 and Jonah said, I, I got out of go. He, he ran. And, and then God puts him in the belly of a whale, right? And he spits him out on dry land and sends him to Nineveh. Uh, Jonah shows up. Up out there, he preaches the, the whole nation, the whole Assyrian capital. They turn to God and, and they get saved, man. And in just a matter of a hundred years, they're back off in a sin. They're going to rise up in judgment against the nation of Israel. Friend, can you, can you imagine? Can you imagine at the judgment? If you refuse to receive Christ, and you're standing there before the great white throne of God, who's going to rise up in judgment against you? Who's going to rise up and say, hey, hey, I don't want, he heard the gospel. That, that lady, she heard the gospel. Do you know that in that day that you're going to stand before God, you're going to give an account of every single thing you have done? God says he's going to open the books. You're going to be judged out of the books. Not the Christian. See, he's already been through judgment by that time. He's received the reward to lay at the feet of the Father and at the feet of the Lord. Non believer today, listen to me. When you step out of this life, there's only one place for you. You say, Well, God surely wouldn't send me to hell. <coughs> Friend, God's not going to send you to hell. Right. You're going to send yourself. Right. And so as we jump back into the text, we see this discussion. But notice this demon, verse 43. An unclean spirit. He's a, he's a dirty demon. Let me get in the locker room with you for a minute. Invite me in. Say, come on in. Come on in. All right, I'm coming. Look here. This dirty demon, uh, he's called an unclean spirit. Uh, an unclean spirit as found here is, is said not to be found anywhere in the Old Testament. But the idea of a demon is... And they're always related to idols, idolatry, idol worship, and it's considered unclean. The word unclean, it's defined as this, impure, foul, and implies to be morally lewd. That's, in, that's indecent, vulgar, I mean anything that is uh, just dirty. That's what we're talking about here in this word unclean. So if you're, if you're a parent in the room and you've got a child that, that, that maybe is involved in athletics, I want to say something to you. Uh, I've preached to teenagers for a long time. And I, ever since I got saved, God opened the door to youth ministry. And that's where I began to, uh, God began to use me. And I've preached to young people about the idolatry found in sports today. And, and, and they refuse it. They reject it a lot of times. Most people say, well, Shane, if you just crazy, you don't know what you're talking about. But listen, I, I begin to think about this word unclean. And, and, and I realize, what is it? What is it that dominates every male sports locker room? Every one of them. I played football for 12 years. And every time I'd go in the locker room, it, it wasn't just that, that, that dirty pad smell. You know what I'm saying? It was the spirit of uncleanness. And I, I realized that, that uncleanness dominates the locker room. Not just the male locker room these days. The female locker room. There's a spirit of homosexuality, lesbian activity all over Middle Tennessee. All over. 
You see, I'll say, I believe it. I've seen it with my own eyes. I, I've watched young ladies' lives be destroyed. And, and so what dominates the locker room? It's the uncleanness of immorality, of alcohol, of drugs. I'm telling you today, far too many parents have promoted the idea of their children being gods in America, but they're absolutely blind to the idol worship found therein. Man, listen to me. If you get up on Saturday morning and you paint yourself up orange and white and sit in front of the TV and lick the, lick the remote every time they get a first down, do you know what I'm saying? What is wrong with you? I love, I love football. I enjoy it, man. But, but you need to open your eyes, man. You're crazy. You know what I'm saying? You say, I don't get orange and white. I do it with creamy and red. Well, hey, man, you're crazy too. Good night. children in a place of prestige and honor? Are, are, you, are you pouring every ounce of your resources into them? Now don't get me wrong. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. They are a gift from God. Man, you've been giving them uh, the man who, who has uh, his children. Uh, it's like a, like a hunter with his, his quiver full of arrows. Man, I mean, they're, a, they're a heritage from the Lord. Hey, but we ought to pour into them the things of God, not the things of the world. And so if you're, if you're just sacrificing them to the ball gods. Man, build up the body of Christ like that. Yeah. Don't, don't waste your life. Don't waste their life. Give them unto the Lord. Many young people's lives will be destroyed by this unclean spirit that moves in first by way of the locker room. I'm telling you. You say, I don't believe it. Well, just go to Grundy County and ask those parents of that young man who was assaulted a few weeks ago. You think that's clean? That's unclean. That is a spirit of uncleanness. Yeah. And that's the, that's the demonically inspired, influenced activity in our school system. Friend, it's real. It is so real. And it's not only real there, it's real all around us. But notice here, not only this, this, the, the, uh, this discussion and this demon, but notice his departure. He goes through, he, he goes out of a man, and he goes through dry places seeking rest, and finds none. The phrase gone out is one word in the Greek and it's used in a variety of applications in the New Testament. It's used in relation to the departure of demons from two men in Matthew's Gospel chapter number 8. Uh, here in this text it's very important because we realize that there's only one who has the authority to cast out a demon. Jesus. But man, you've got to get the picture here. Something, something incredible is about to take place. Verse 22, Jesus cast a demon out of a guy. Nowhere through this text do we find him leaving. I think he's still present. Why is that important? Jesus is about to say this in verse 44. Verse 43, he said that demon goes out. But watch this. Verse 44, when he finds no place to rest, he says, I will return to my house. Dude, he just said that that thing could come back. <coughs> and would we all agree this morning that the extraction of a demon is a miracle? It's a miracle. But friend, can I say to you this morning, you may have experienced a miracle, but if you didn't give your heart to Christ, you're still lost. You say, well, I met God down on the roadside and he, he pulled me out of a burning car. Well, did you repent of your sin and give your heart to Jesus? He said, no. You're lost. Biblically, you're lost. You need to be saved. Friend, listen. Just because a miracle takes place in your life does not mean that you've been born again. You have got to come before God and agree with Him that you're a, a sinner in need of a Savior, man. And accept Him as Lord. You say, what does it mean to be Lord? It means that He calls the shots in your life. You say, does that mean I will never mess up? No. But it does mean that you'll repent day by day, giving your heart unto Christ over and over and over again. Because He's Lord. You say, can I get saved more than once? No. But if you say, you may not have no problem openly identifying with Jesus. He's Lord. Notice this demon's discomfort. He goes through dry places. No water. No water. 
Maybe that's what your life's like today. You just, just no comfort whatsoever. Uh, no relief, no water. Can't find any rest. And that was what my life was like. Couldn't find any relief. I see the words of 1 Peter 5 made alive right there. The devil walking about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Friend, listen. Jesus would will save you, but Satan will destroy your life. He decides, this demon decides to go back home. He just Jesus just kicked him out, but yet now says that he has the ability to come back. And so I, I you say, well, how did, he even, how did this demon get out? How, how did that all take place? Here's what I believe. I believe that somebody brought this man who was blind and mute. I believe they drug him to Jesus. I believe that man in that moment, he, he wanted deliverance from that thing that was hindering him. And he cries out to God for deliverance. Are you with me? And somehow, someway, by the grace of God, there's deliverance. But yet, now, as soon as deliverance has taken place, this is how it goes down in the lives of individuals today. Maybe, 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 maybe I should say it like this. Maybe a soul winner knows somebody who, who's lost and they've got a drug addiction. And maybe one of you who, who loves the Lord, you, you go and you try to reach them, you, you bring them to church, and, and at the invitation, man, you just drag them down to the altar, and, and, and that person in that moment of desperation, they want deliverance, they cry out to God, and God somehow, some way, supernaturally brings deliverance. But as soon as deliverance comes, that individual who never gave their heart to Christ, they just wanted relief from their problem, they never give their heart to Jesus, and in just a short while, they're back in the sea. Are you with me? Listen to what Jesus said. The last state of that man is far worse than the first. When you come to Jesus, you better come with all your heart. Not just half-hearted looking for some help in time of need, but giving yourself wholly unto God. That's what he wants. That's what he desires. And so he finds his house empty. You say, what's that mean? The Bible says plainly that when you invite the, the Lord into your heart, the Spirit of God will supernaturally invade your house. He takes up residence there. You become a temple of the living God. You once housed a dirty demon, but now there's deity living in you. Yeah. And so you, you've been saved, you've been born again, bought with the precious blood of Christ, redeemed not with corruptible things like silver and gold. I mean, you, you've been born again. But not this guy. Not the one who just wants a little help because he's hurting. Forgive your heart to Jesus today. Notice, notice the assumption of ownership here by this demon. He says, I'll return to my house. My house. Bro, this thing done squatted on your lot, man. I mean, he, he's sitting on your couch, kicking over your coffee table. He's taking your lunch money and buying his favorite snacks. Do you know what I'm saying? He's feasting on the things of the flesh. And he's using you as a slave. That's what he's doing. Maybe he looks great on the outside, but on the inside you're suffering today. Man, this guy, that's who he is. He's filled with death and desperation. And Jesus is explaining to him that if you don't give your heart to Christ, this demon can move back into your life. <coughs> as I studied this text, and as I heard a guy preach on this, uh, this, these verses one day, my mind automatically went to Mark chapter 5. If you have a Bible, turn to Mark 5. Mark 5, I'm going to read the text and I'll be, I'll be finished. Somebody needs to, to surrender to the Lord today, man. Somebody just needs to fall before Christ. God, I give you everything I am. And notice, notice Mark 5. If there's, a, if there's a subtitle above that in your Bible, it would say something like this. A demon-possessed man healed. Notice the words of Mark. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Galileans. And when he, that's Jesus, had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains. Do you see that? Because he had often been bound with shackles. And he pulled them apart. 
shattered with broken pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. Now listen. And always night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. Listen. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Now look at verse 8. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? Now listen. And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are men. Do you see that? <coughs> You see that guy right there? Man, man, that, in my mind, in my mind, that's a, that's a picture of self-reformation without regeneration. I mean, somebody who tried to clean his act up, and, and, and yet, yet, yet he never got, yet, never got saved. Now, remember what Jesus said, verse 43, when an unclean spirit goes out of the land, when he returns, he brings how many with him? How many? Everybody say seven. Seven. Bring seven more with him. Do you realize that this dude ha had just said that his name is Legion? Do you know what a Legion is? In the Roman military, a legion was anywhere between three and 6,000 troops. And so here he is, this man's housing that many demons. He, I, I can see him in my mind time and time and time again. He's trying to clean his act up. He, he thought, man, I can kick this habit. I, I can throw this drug away. I don't have to live like this anymore. I, I, I can get rid of this side of my computer. I, I, I can get rid of alcohol. I don't have to live like that anymore. And then time and time and time again, that dirty demon moves back into his life because he would never give his heart to Christ. Yeah. Over and over and over again. Seven times, seven times, seven times. Here he is, man. He, he, this legion of demons is tormenting and torturing him. His body was exposed to the elements, man. He was naked. His mind was exposed to the enemy. He was crying out. His, his heart was being broken over and over and over again. So much so that the pain on the inside was working its way on the outside. He was cutting himself. Yep. Friend, you know what I'm talking about. If you've never been lost and you have, and you lived any kind of sinful life, and you did, friend, you know what I'm saying. There's pain in sin. Yeah. Thank God Jesus brings forgiveness. And today, today, friend, listen, I don't care where you're from. I don't know you. You don't know me. But here's what I know. I know the Apostle Paul said I'm chief among sinners. He killed Christians, consented to their death. He lived a perfectly moral life to the best that we know. But yet he says in Romans 7, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body? Then he begins to give praise. Thanks be unto God for Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So, Brother Shane, I, I've been hooked on drugs. I've committed all kinds of acts of immorality. I've been in and out of jail for things that I'm even ashamed to speak. Friend, listen to me. I'm not your judge. Jesus is the judge. And here's what he says. Are you listening? Come unto me, all you that labor. 